trying to work on messages on the Sermon on the Mount and going through the Sermon on the Mount. We're at Matthew chapter 6 and we're at verse number, um, we're going to look at verse number 5 down through verse number 15. And, and actually he's talking there about when you pray. And I'm going to just, for sake of time, verse number 9 says this. He begins what we often call the Lord's Prayer. It is also called the Disciples' Prayer. It actually is the Disciples' Prayer more than the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is actually John chapter 17. But this would be something kind of like a form prayer or something that you and I, a guide, a prayer guideline that we should have. And it's powerful. And I'm going to preach on some of the, it flows tonight. If I, things what I preach on that tonight. But anyway, right now I want to preach on this phrase in verse number nine. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, help me to preach today. Father, thank you that I can call you my Father. I thank you that I'm your son through the new birth. I pray God today that we would have a fresh awakening of the joy and the privilege and the wonder of being able to call our God our Father. And Lord, we do hallow your name today. Glorify yourself. Save the lost that are in this building today. Encourage the people of God in a very special way. Draw them to yourself and let them know, God, the answer to all problems and the answer to the strife and the trouble and the burdens of life is to draw near to the Father. And so, Lord, did we do that today. And I pray this be a great day of comfort and a great day of blessing to these people in Jesus' name. Amen. I... In a way of introduction, I want to say this to you this morning, that to call and address and know our God in terms called Father is unique to the religions of the world. Now, listen to me this morning. I, I'll tell you something. God did something with this study in my heart. And I, I, I didn't get this out of nobody's book or nothing. I just kept meditating for weeks now upon this one phrase, Our Father which art in heaven. And the Lord blessed me yesterday, and all of a sudden it started coming. I mean, it just started, the Lord just started bringing it. And the first thing the Lord spoke to me was this. Reggie, did you realize that no other religions of the world call their God a father that I know of? They don't call him father. You think about it. In fact, if it is, the religions of the world, they, they never call their God's father because he's not their father. And he can't be their father. Their gods, listen to me, are distant they're removed from their personal life. They're unknown, except in a cloudy sense. They're harsh, often harsh gods. They're indifferent gods. In other words, they're not interested personally in your life. They're kind of removed beings. And they're without a relationship. Now, you need to really think about this. The difference between Christianity and the God of the Bible and the gods of false religions. That those... Gods are not known as their father. It's kind of the way Satan and the socialists in this nation are trying to carve out the concept of fatherhood in our country. Think about this. Right now in some races, 70 to 80 percent of children do not know their father. They don't have a father. It's being children being born in this nation. The concept of fatherhood has been really stripped in this country. Even churches really don't teach and preach and build fatherhood. And now we've got children across this country who don't know their dad. They don't have a concept of who daddy is. They don't have fellowship with him. And if they know who their father is, sometimes it's not in an intimate way. It is distant. It is unknown. And it is irreverent. And it almost matches what false religion's concept of God is. He is not a father. What would be the purpose in our culture doing this? Is to destroy the family concept, that which God ordained first. I'm going to give you something this morning really, really good you need to get a hold of. There are three basic institutions of authority that God instituted in the Bible, and you people are familiar with them. Number one is the home. That's the number one institution God created. Number two, God created uh, the church. All right, he created the church and he created government. He actually created the institution of government in the Old Testament before the church. But those are the three institutions. Now watch this very carefully. You can't find a church in the country that hardly doesn't believe it's fine to preach on the institution of home. And certainly no church would say that it's a, they shouldn't preach on the church. But how many churches do not believe that you should preach on the institution of government? Did you ever think of that? Isn't that an abomination? Isn't that a trip? That it's okay to preach on the home. It's okay to preach on the church, but stay away from government. And yet there are all three in the Bible given of God as institutions that God has authority over. 
That's one of our problems in this country, the preachers that quit preaching on government. Because they don't want to offend anybody. It's the, the purpose of this destruction of the concept of God the Father is so that we won't know God as a Father. That we won't even understand the concept of the new birth. It's to destroy the family. It's to destroy the home. And the higher concept, what's this? Of a personal, loving, holy, honorable, spiritual, heavenly Father who is God Almighty as well. It's amazing to me, Brother Phil, to think that the God that created this universe, who is Almighty God, is still... Wants to be my heavenly father. Now that's something. I hope you'll grab hold of that today. That he's not some abstract somebody out there off in the space. But that he is, if you're saved, he is your heavenly father. And one of the greatest things that you can do is rebuild the concept of the spiritual father and the earthly father in your heart and in your mind. He is God Almighty as well as your heavenly father. I want you to hear this message from your heart today, and I want you to hear it on two levels. Number one, I want you to hear it on the level of your heavenly spiritual father, the God of the Bible. But the second level I want you to get is preaching it on a level and hearing it on a level of your earthly physical father. All right? Now, there's nobody in here but what, that has a perfect father. Nobody in here has a perfect father, an earthly father. So just, you need to put some things behind you. You need to get over some things and have an attitude of rebuilding from here. All right? Because one of the things I've talked about in this church in the long-term generation revival is restoring men, their families, their homes. And the restoring, part of the restoring of manhood is restoring the concept of fatherhood. And there is no way to restore fatherhood as it should be unless we understand the fatherhood of God as is addressed here by Jesus Christ, our Father, which art are, which are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Now, I want to get something out of the way. This is going to be a little rough before we start right down through these things. And we're going to go through these quick, but I want to get something out of the way. It's going to be a little rough. Hang on to your seat. One of the greatest spiritual crimes that has ever been committed and perpetrated against humanity is that of the popes and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. In their attempt to steal and claim the title and the term of spiritual fatherhood from God. Are you listening to me? The Catholic Church has perpetrated one of the greatest crimes against humanity in their attempt to steal the fatherhood of God and bring it and claim it unto their own powers. That's theft. They have never been given that by Scripture. Never. That is reserved unto God the Father. And they have stolen it. The Pope is nothing more than a hellish father of deception, certainly not a holy father. The term holy father that the Pope in Rome uses and has himself addressed as is so holy that God only uses it one time in the entire Word of God. It's in John chapter 17, verse 11, and it is used by the Lord Jesus Christ in the greatest prayer that was ever prayed on the face of this earth that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane on his knees and face before his father. He cried, Holy Father. But the Pope wants to be called that. I tell you, he is an antichrist. He is not even saved, much less a spiritual leader. He is a thief of the title of Almighty God. Try that in your average church these days. Jesus specifically instructed in Matthew 23, verse 9, that we are to call no man father. Talking about a spiritual fatherhood. He specifically said that, and yet they do that. What an abomination. For a rinky-dink, deluded man who is not even married, much less a father, claiming falsely to not only be a priest and the go-between for you and God, and then to add insult to injury to the Word of God by wanting you to address him as father, is the height. Of hell's hypocrisy. Y'all getting awful quiet on me out there. That's, I'm going to tell you something. It is a horrid, horrid sin and crime the Roman Catholic Church has perpetrated on mankind. I'm going to tell you something. You know why? Because that kid growing up in that Catholic Church has no concept of what it is to have a heavenly father because he's all used to this dude right here. 
and they have transferred everything that fatherhood means and the fatherhood of God means to that child and should mean to that child to themselves. They're thieves. And you can send your uncle one of these tapes. The whole religion is a rigmarole that is a blatant attack not only upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, but on the God of the true and the true Holy Father, our Lord Jesus Christ Father. It's grand theft and larceny on a spiritual scale. And finally, I'm going to say this to you, it's Luciferic. Because in Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible shows you what Satan wanted. He said, I will sit in the place of God. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to take God's place. And that is what the Roman Catholic Church and their system does, is take God's place. It's Luciferic. Well, 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 aren't we having a wonderful time in church this morning? Truth will set you free, amen? Makes me happy. Makes me happy. All right, let's take off. You got this deal right there. The terms, uh, Matthew 6, 9, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Number one, write it in there. It's a term of relationship. Father is a term of relationship. Let me tell you something. My daddy's sitting back here. He's my father. He ain't like nobody else in this church. Amen? Oh, you did got, you did die up and shrivel up on me, you bunch of Episcopalians. <laughs> He's my father. There ain't nobody else in this church like him to me. There is a relationship there. It's not, it's not a casual deal. There is a special relationship. The Bible said you must be born again of the Spirit of God. I was conceived by that man right there. And we're born of the Spirit of God. This right here is the seed by which is planted in your heart that brings forth the new life, makes you a new creature in Jesus Christ. We're born again of the Spirit of God. But as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. He said, not the, well, not the born of the will of man or the will of flesh. But he said, born of God. It's a relationship. You know what? A father is a father. I want to tell you one thing right now. When the days are dark in my life, do you know who I'm liable to call more than anybody else in the whole wide world? Is that guy right there. I mean, can I tell you something else? My, my experience has been in life this. That when my chips are down and when things are rough and when things are tough, do you know who has honestly, outside my wife and my children, do you know who has, I could always depend on to call me and say, son, how you doing? My father. Fatherhood is a special relationship. And God ordains it. Listen to me. You need to understand that as a father, your relationship to your children is very, very special. It is a relationship term. Number two, it's a term of fellowship. Amen. It's a term of fellowship. It is not some distant, removed, you can't talk to me deal. Fathers ought to talk to their children. There ought to be fellowship for them. You ought to be able to talk to your daddy. You say, man, I can't. I, listen, I don't know all about your circumstance. But do all that you can to have fellowship with your father. Because your father wants to have fellowship with you. You know what gives me conviction, Brother Randy? Is that my, I've got six kids. I'll tell you something. I love to talk to them. I love to visit with them. Donnie, I'll tell you what. Do you like to talk to your kids? Let me tell you what. Isn't that something special just about talking to your kids? And I just love for them to sit down. I love to be around them. I love to talk to them. I get convicted because, you know, I get to thinking maybe my daddy would like me to talk to him like that, too. It's fellowship. And I can I say something? You fathers and you children in this church. He said, this ain't Father's Day. That's what you preaching. I don't try to preach on Father's Day, Father. I just preach it when it comes along. It's here today. Amen. Amen. Be a father. Have, have fellowship. Talk to your kids. Visit with your kids. Talk to your kids about God. Talk to your kids about prayer. Pray with your family. Pray with your kids. Have fellowship with them. Amen. Thank you. The Bible said in Matthew 4, 6, the heart, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I know. I figured it out. I've just now figured it out. Just now hit me what's wrong here this morning. I ain't got on my gray slacks and my blue jacket. <laughs> and y'all sitting back there looking at me. He ain't got on the same clothes. I wonder what happened anyway. Did Karen burn him? Hey, forget about this, all right? I walked in the church, very first thing, Dan Friend. Woo, what got some slick news on there, man? Shut up, Danny. Leave me alone. Amen. Don't say nothing. Barely got here with him on anyway. Hey, my father, it's a relationship. The second, it's fellowship. Number three, it's a term of likeness. You know what it means? Hey, I want to tell you whether, whether my daddy likes it or not, I'm something like him. I want to tell you what, he's in me and I'm in him. And listen, we ought to be like our heavenly father. It's a term. It indicates that we ought to be like our father. In Romans chapter 8, 29, we're being conformed to the image of his son. 
And it's a term, fatherhood is a term of likeness. It's a term of relationship. It's a term of fellowship. Number four, it's a term of endearment. Abba, Father, is what Jesus Christ said in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Let me tell you something about my daddy. I remember when I was, how old are you, Stephen? You're 15. Good land. How old are you? How many? 13. 13. Good. How old are you? Nine, you're just about the right age. I was eight years old. I was down at church one night. Me and the boys used to run around. We'd play tag in that churchyard. We'd run and play tag and couldn't wait till that boring preacher got done. Well, aren't preachers boring? They're pitiful. Why don't we get out of church and have fun? Amen. And so, <laughs> wow, boy, that didn't go over good, did it? I want to tell you something, all. Hey, I'm just going to have a good time whether you do or not. All right, I'm coming to worship yeah. God. And But I never will forget one time when this happens to come out social downstairs. I'm running downstairs. And my daddy, and you know, I always used to sit on my daddy's lap. And you know what I did? And I started, and daddy wanted me, he, he kind of reached out, take me and put him on my lap. And you know what I thought, Ty? Like, this ain't, uh, ain't going to work. All them other boys see me eight years old sitting on my daddy's lap. <laughs> How many's ever been there? You thought you were too big to sit on your daddy's lap. But you know something, Father is a term of endearment. I don't know how many of you daddies enjoy your children sitting on your lap? If you don't, you ought to. Amen? I don't tell you what, you still ought to make them sit on your lap every once in a while. Just grab them and make them sit on your lap. Amen? If they don't want to anyway. But I'm telling you something, it's a term of endearment. Romans 18, 8, 15 says, We cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 6, 4, 6 says, Because you're sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Abba, Father means Daddy. My daddy, it's a term of endearment. It's more than just father. It's a closeness, somebody that loves me. Number five, it's a term of affection and love. I want to tell you, hey, I I want to give you a Bible quiz this morning. I'll tell you what, I'll make it fun. Five bucks to the person who gets it right. First person gets it right, five dollars. I'll pay you tonight. (laughs) I ain't got any money with me. You have to come back to church tonight, okay? What's the first message Jesus Christ ever preached, public message he ever preached? Hmm? In the temple. What did he preach? You're right about being in the temple. What did he preach? First message Jesus Christ ever preached. You know what he preached? This is amazing. A Christian church don't even know the first message Jesus Christ ever preached. It's amazing. You know what most people will say? Summer on the Mount. Not true. Luke chapter 4. He came in the temple, opened up the book of Isaiah, and he preached this. Well, I said, this is sweet. You'll love this. He said, I came to preach the gospel to the, to preach the gospel to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. Now, if that doesn't tell you he's our father and how he loves us and how he's endeared to us, the first message he ever preached was to heal the brokenhearted. Wow. That's what he came for. Preach the gospel to the poor and heal the brokenhearted. Number six, it's not only a term of affection and love. Number six, it's a term of inheritance. Glory. Galatians 4, 7 says, if we're a son, then an heir to God, of God through Jesus Christ. Do you know what that means? Daddy, I hate to tell you this, but I'm your heir. <laughs> he may cut me out. I don't know. I wouldn't blame him if he did. But you know what? I'm his son, Frankie, and I'm a pretty good shot. I'm a pretty good lineup. You are the deadest bunch i ever seen in my life this morning. Mercy. Does anybody here like an inheritance? Sure you do, you lying little outfit. But I'm going to ask your wife, and she'll expose you in a minute. You've probably talked about it to her. Now listen to me, man. Hey, what are we thinking about? An inheritance. He's our father. We're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He's our Father. We're going to inherit glory. Don't let the devil rob you of God being your Father. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to destroy your concept, your relationship, your fellowship, all that comes with Him being your Father. And we go through life beaten and broken and mad and sad and murmuring, and we don't even realize what would... I mean, listen to me. I could... Under, number seven... Father is a term of honor. Exodus 20 says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Let me tell you something. I ought to honor that man. I ought to honor my heavenly father with my life. Matthew 15, Jesus said, Honor thy father and thy mother. He that curseth father and his mother, let him die the death. He never, you know, Jesus never negated the Old Testament command to kill the kids that were rebellious. 
Now, I'm going to preach on this. Hey, I got a question. I got something. I got another. By the way, thank all you kids for all your reports. Man, I got a stack of them. I mean, they're beautiful to read. I'm telling you something good about, you know, uh, how can I be godly and yet, and yet attractive? It's wonderful. Might I'll give you, another, give you another one this morning. And that is, how can I honor my father? I'll tell you what let's do tonight. Let's come back. You write down this afternoon in one paragraph. Let's keep it to 50 words or less. How can I honor my father? And we'll have you stand and read them tonight. You all ready? Take, how many take that assignment? Raise your hand. Bunch of lazy. Look at this. This is pathetic. <laughs> Fifty words or less, you won't even do that how you could honor your father? Next question I'll ask you, is honoring your father with conditions in the Bible? Are there conditions upon which you should or should not honor your father? I challenge you tonight. I mean, it's going to be, tell you what, I'm going to preach till one o'clock till 14 of you say, I'll be, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come. I'll, I'll, you got him, all right, got him, all right. Number eight, it's a term of sacredness. You ought to honor your daddy, Amen. You ought to honor your daddy. I mean that. Term of sacredness. He said, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means valuable, sacred, holy, highly esteemed, worthy of worship, never to be used in vain. Jesus described him as holy father. I'm going to join with Joel this morning. Watch out for the euphemism. Don't be saying golly and gosh and all that stuff. Those are euphemisms. Taking God's name in vain. Clean yourself up of it. Number nine, it's a term of protection. Father's a term of protection. I've heard enough about the mama grizzlies. We're not grizzlies. We're human beings. Now, mamas will protect, and I'm glad of that, but I'm going to tell you what. There ain't nothing like Big Daddy coming after you. That's right. You get a father that's got to protect his spirit, and I'll tell you something. He's, he's deaf on wheels. You touch his... You touch his child, you're you're dead. We ought to protect our children. Watch this. We ought to protect our children physically. Hey, watch out where you're letting your kids go. Watch out when you're up here. Watch out, watch out, watch out. I don't want to see some two or four or five or seven year old boy or girl in this church abducted up here at the battlefield mall somewhere at Walmart. Watch all your kids. Keep them where you're at. Protect them physically. Don't be tinkering around. And I know you wouldn't. And I'm not going to say if that happened that you were taking around. But I'm saying I'm trying to challenge you. Protect your children physically. But protect them spiritually also. You watch who they hang around. You watch who their friends are. You watch what doctrines taught to them. You watch what they're taught. Let me tell you something. Don't you let some idiotic somebody teach them they came from a monkey. That You're not protecting your children if you allow that to happen. Now, it's just the flat truth of it. You protect them educationally. You don't let them be anything thrown down their spiritual throat. You protect them emotionally. There's times when your kids need to be hugged. And there's times when they need to be forgiven. And there's times when they need to be encouraged. And there's times when they need to have somebody standing with them. You need to heal the broken hearted. That's what your Father in Heaven does. He'll heal your broken heart. And you need to heal the broken heart of your own children. We need to protect them socially from fads and trends and worldly. Let me tell you something, boys and girls. Just because your mom and dad don't let you wear this, that, and the other and do everything, they're trying to protect you from danger. David, all the time in the book of Psalms, talked about God is his shelter. God is his refuge. God is the wings. God is the rocks that he hid himself in and was protected by. And God, David saw God the Father as a protector. And if there's anything a father ought to be, it's a protector. And I want to tell you something. God, my Father, is protecting me. I'd have been dead years ago had not my Father protected me. Oh, this is good news. I tell you, the devil can't touch me without his permission. Amen. I don't have to worry about tomorrow. Then number ten, it's a term of trust. Y'all didn't think it was going to go so fast, did you? It's a term of trust. If there's anyone in the world a child should be able to trust, it's his father. And you can trust your heavenly father. Amen. You can trust your heavenly father. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to think, well, where's God at now? He's still there. He's right there where he's always been, and he is taking care of matters. You can trust your heavenly father. But I'll tell you this. I heard the old story about they used to say that the Jewish fathers used to take their kids and put them up on a big ledge. And when they was about four years old and say, jump. And then you step back and let him hit the gravel and say, don't trust nobody. I disagree with it. I believe you can teach your kids not to trust people, but to trust God. And I believe you ought to be able to say to your child, you can trust your father. I'm not going to do you wrong. I'm not going to rip you off. 
Number 11, it's a term of provision. It's a term of provision. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. Luke says this, If ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father give good things to them that have? Hey, I've got a good heavenly Father this morning. Yeah. Say, my daddy used to come home from assessing and think you need to have a, a double mint gum in a, in a little paper sack. You know what daddy was thinking about? He's thinking about his little boys when he headed home and stopped by the store. And I'll tell you what, he pulled that little pack of double mint gum out of there, and it meant just as much to me as a four-wheeler does to you now. Yeah, 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 sure Amen. One night he come home, skinny from, he come home, and you know what he had? He, he said, Reggie, he said, when he walked in the kitchen, and he had a little border collie baby puppy. And I named her Trixie, and he brought her home. And I loved old Trixie. And my daddy brought that little dog home to me. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to let me know he loved me, cared about my life. Oh, and by the way, boys, that's the same day that whooped the britches off of me one night. <laughs> just, yeah, just one, yeah, there you go. Hey, think about this, your Heavenly Father preparing a place for you. He said it's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. And I'm just saying this, that God says, If ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give good things to them that ask Him? You know what I just believe, Sister Millie? I just believe in asking him for good things. Now, I ain't going to tell you some of the stuff I ask him because it's selfish. That's right. I ask God for all kinds of stuff. Oh, I know you're sanctified holy and ain't ask God for nothing. You're just asking for everybody else all the time. Oh, Lord, I don't know. This ain't going like I thought it would. Number 12. By the way, wait, wait a minute. On that provision thing, I think there's something in the Bible. Does it say somewhere that if a man won't provide for his own household, he's worth an infidel and have to deny the face? Amen. So you sorry, low down, lazy dog, get to work. Amen. Quit taking checks. Amen. Hey! You know why we've got a close presidential race? When you've got a socialistic, communistic thing in there that believes in killing babies, and you know why it's keeping close? Because you got 49% of Americans getting checks and 51% sending them to them. And you can buy votes by offering people money. Yeah. You play on people's laziness. Why work when the government will send it to you? Oh, I love to do this. I know you failed. I know you got the lawyer to get you a disability check when you can work just as hard as the rest of us. And I know you're a thief. I'm tired of putting up with it. You're just stealing from your neighbor. You're just stealing from these hardworking guys here working. You know what? They're trying to feed their family. But no, no, they got to shove you a bunch of it each week. Had a man told me just here recently. He said, he said, Reggie, he said, I married this lady. She had some children. Said they're all grown children. All three of them are on disability. All of them are in their 20s and low 30s. Every one of them is on disability. He said, one of them saw my check stub the other day. He said, I'll drive clear out of state to work and come back every weekend. He said, one of them looked at my check stub and said, you almost make enough to cover me yourself. He said, I about exploded. Well, number 12. Term of acceptance and affirmation and reception. This is important. This is really, really important. I cannot imagine some parent saying to a child, I wish you was never born. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you've ever said that to your children... You better get on your knees and beg God to forgive you, and then you better go to that child and beg them to forgive you. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about accepting children, accepting children that God gives you. Affirm, not only accepting them, but affirming that they're part of your family. Listen, you're a part of our family. You're important. You're just as important as every, everybody else in this family. You are part of our family. We love you. You're accepted, and we receive you. Think about this, but as many as received him. Acceptance. It's a term of acceptance, affirmation, and reception. Now watch this. Your kids, don't you assume that the... How many of you daddies understand that while you're working and while you're busy, the devil's talking to your boy? The devil's talking to your girl. And may tell them, daddy ain't got no time for you. Daddy don't care. He wishes you never had showed up. One of the curses on America is this issue. We're not receiving our children. We're killing them. And we're rejecting them. Now, I'm going to throw a hardball at you. Listen to me. 
Everybody's oh, abortion's wrong. I'm not kidding your children. Yeah, we're rejected. Hey, that's the sign of the last days. They will lose their natural affection. That's part of the curse of the latter days. The loss of natural affection. There's nothing more naturally affectionate than a mother bearing a child and nursing that child and holding that child to her breast. That's natural affection. God said in the last days, they won't even have natural affection. They'll kill their own children. Let me tell you what we're doing, though. We're making sure we don't have any. And sit in church and then act holy to them that's killing them. If we're not careful, we're taking birth control pills that are nothing more than abortants. Yeah. Study it out. Do your homework. Do your homework. Do your homework. Yeah. Let me tell you something. Which one of my kids do I not want? Yeah. My land living, Karen. What would happen to us? Aren't you glad God sent Susanna along? I mean, we've had a blast. At least I have. <laughs> we have had a blast. I'm going to tell you something. We go out four-wheeling together. I mean, we just have the best old time. Our, Karen and I would be living in an empty nest right now. Rest of the sorry outfits moved out on us. <laughs> hey, except children. Except children. I would ask you something. What if God said, that's it, I don't want any more kids? What if God would say, I don't want you? No wonder the Bible says, all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Get a grip. Get a concept of who your heavenly Father is. Quit letting the world twist your head into thinking about children that way. One of the most satanic movements in America is our rejection of children. One of the greatest evidences of eternal salvation, by the way, is the issue of birth, sonship, fatherhood. And I want to encourage you. Look every child you've got in the eye and tell them, I'm glad God sent you into our family. Susanna, you ever heard me say that? You betcha. I'm glad God sent you into our family. You tell every one of them that. You, don't let, you let the devil fill their head full of lies. You look them in the eye. You look them in the heart. And you say, I'm glad for you. I'm thankful for you. I may not be a best daddy in the world, but I'm going to tell you what. I'll love you as much as any daddy can love you. And I'm glad you're here. They need to be accepted. I, I would almost like to camp out on that because we're seeing so many kids in our country rejected by their own fathers. They won't even take responsibility for their own children. Mothers who won't even take care. Just the other day in the news, man dropped, they, they, they dropped off a, like a six, seven month old baby on the steps of some building up there in the city. Just dropped them off. Throwing babies in the trash dumpsters. I never heard tell of anything like it. Folks, this is a heathen pagan nation. And it's all about this thing that we want to have our life and not be bothered by kids. God help us. Number 13, it's a term of responsibility and privilege. It's a term of responsibility and privilege. I want to tell you something. You'll never have a greater responsibility than raising a bunch of kids. And you'll never have a greater privilege than raising a bunch of kids. Well, I want to tell you something. Every, the thing that I have in my cherished heart that nobody can steal from me is the years that we had with our children. My daddy used to say, if you saw Reg in that old gray pickup truck of his, that old, red, that old gray Ford truck, you'd see three little heads. No one can steal from me the days that I had with my sons and my daughters. What a privilege. We need to look at raising children and receiving children as a privilege. That God entrusted this child to me. I don't know about everybody else, but I, I can remember... There used to be a song back when I was living in Egypt. The name of Don somebody, and it was, Do I Look Like a Daddy to You? Anybody remember that song? One or two people. All right, but some other heathens in here, like me. I really, and I love that old song. But I never will forget when Nathan was born. And I remember, you know, that she had tried to have a baby and couldn't have a baby and had to have a serious section and it turned into a big deal. I mean, I remember my mother was up to the hospital. I remember telling mom, you know, I just I felt bad, you know. I thought, you know, I just, you know, all those emotions run through, you know. I think I'm bringing, her, you know, hurt and sorrow to her life. And pretty soon, you know, I was sitting in there and I'm all kind of, you know, just on this you know, deal. And this nurse just steps in the doorway and she had this little yellow blanket. And she said, are you Mr. Kelly? And I said, yes, I am. She said, do you want to see your son? And she handed him to him, and my life changed. 
And I swear as God is my witness, there was a, something, something in my soul that said, you've got to take care of this thing. You've been entrusted with something. It's not. This is not a car. This is not a four-wheeler. This is not a boat. This is a God-given child. Number one, the responsibility and privilege of training our children. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, and not depart from it. Still true. That means that you should train them by practice and precept. I will tell you this. I don't think your kids learn as much by your perfect living as they do by your failures and your willingness to repent. That's probably when they learn the most. But we train them through the Word of God. Part of your training is having them in this church house this morning. That's part of the training of your children, but that certainly can't be anywhere near all of it. Sometimes they need rebuke. Sometimes they need reproof. And sometimes they need correction. But we train them by practice and by precept. That word train means to point in an exact direction. Exact direction. It is good for man to bear the yoke in his youth, to learn responsibility. The second thing that responsibility and privilege of not just training but teaching our children in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible teaches us that we're to train up, or we're to, t- you fathers, teach your children when you're walking, when you're set, you know, run, when you're, everything you're doing, you're to be teaching your children in all of its life experiences. This is where education has just turned into a Mickey Mouse club. Because true teaching happens in real world experiences. You see, you can sit at a desk for years and work on fractions tables, and they don't mean nothing to you. But if you're trying to cook and you need three-quarter of a cup of brown sugar, all of a sudden fractions mean something to you. So if I was you, I would teach your children fractions by cooking or by using Crescent Ranch or by using a set of Craftsman Ranches. Son, go get me an 11 sixteenths. What's that? Just go hunt for it. See if it fits on this nut. You know. You learn by practical. This is what God, God told us a long time ago. Hey, 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 hey. This little classroom thing, you know, that, that is not where they're really going. How many of you didn't really learn much until you got out of school? Raise your hand. How many of you didn't learn anything in school or after you got out of school? Raise your hand. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. There's a spirit in this church this morning. I'm trying to figure out what it is. But anyway, you say, Reggie, teach him what? Hey, listen up. Now I'm going to make half of you mad. Teach him and say, yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Hallelujah. I didn't say, oh man, old woman. I said, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Teach him. Son, you don't say that. You say, yes, sir. Teach him. Teach him. Another thing I want to teach him. This is deep theology. Teach him how to say, please. You might want to write that down. It's deep now. You might forget it time you get to your truck. Teach your children to say please. And then teach them the oh, whole wonderful thing. Thank you. Some of you guys ought to be hanging off the chandeliers now. Thank God i got a preacher that will help me teach my children. That will back me up from the pulpit. Even when my wife gets mad at me. Some of you women need to shut up and let daddy teach them. Or get behind him and say, if he don't whoop you, I will. Amen. You sit over there and cock your eyebrows when your dad's getting on with the kids and trying to teach you and cock your head, sending signals to your little two-year-old that I wouldn't do that, but I can't do anything about it in this situation. You ought to be next in line. Yes, sir. Another thing y'all teach your kids, say, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Let's practice this, son. Say, I'm sorry. What's that mean, daddy? That means that you regret what you said or regret what you did and you mean it in your heart. And not only that, but it's going to teach you how to have humility. And by humility, you'll be exalted by the Lord, son. Why don't we teach these things? We wonder what's wrong with America. We're not teaching elementary, very simple things. And we're going to church. We're not even teaching our own children. These elementary, we think they're going to pick it up somewhere. Oh, yeah, they're going to pick it up, all right. We need to teach them respect. We need to teach them manners. You don't pick your nose at the dinner table. You don't belch at the table. You don't throw your food all over the table. You don't let the plate come by you and cough in it and pass it on down to Aunt Sue. 
or, or Uncle Henry. All of a sudden, they're going to feel like fasting. <laughs> Teach them manners, amen. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you something this morning. I'm not a Mennonite, and I'm not an Amish. But I'll tell you what, they've got us beat all over the farm raising their kids about being quiet. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll tell you, no, they've got us beat pretty hard about working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy. Now, there's some, listen, I didn't, there's a lot of good, you know, God's doing some wonderful things in this church. I thank God for all the boys that are working here and the kids that work. But I'm telling you something, it wouldn't hurt you to look at them once in a while and learn something from them. You ought to teach them obedience. Alertness. Honesty. Teach them skills. I want to tell you something. It's a stinking shame for you to let your kids back talk to your mother, their mother. It's a stinking shame for you to let your kids soul up like a possum and he ain't going to talk to nobody. Yes, sir. I'm telling you something. Listen. You ought to be ashamed. And I'm going to bring this thing into teaching as part of the discipline and part of the bringing up in the nurture and admonition. Number three is nurture of the Lord. Number four is discipline. God disciplines us. And the way He does it, first of all, He'll speak to you. Second of all, He'll spank you. And third, if you don't, I don't get it, He'll scourge you. And that's the way God works. And that's the way you and I ought to work as a father. First of all, speak to Him. Second of all, spank Him. And if that don't work, scourge Him. You ought to be ashamed. Hey, can I say something, daddies? You ought to be ashamed of yourself for letting your child disobey you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Should I be looking for another church to pastor? Y'all having a vote tonight? Is that what's going on? You ought to be ashamed to let your child disobey. Frank, ain't that right? Somebody help me out there. Some of you daddies help me. You ought to be ashamed to let your child back talk to you and your mama. Amen. Amen. You ought to be ashamed to let them sell up like a possum. <laughs> I ain't talking to nobody for three days. Does everybody in the house understand I'm mad? I'm going to get my way. Nobody's going to be happy around here till I'm happy. Wait till he grows up 18, 19, 24, 32. Wait till he marries. His... Hey, you girls, watch out for these sellers. You know what? If I was a girl, I'd go to the daddy. I'd say, you know what? Your son asked me to marry him. I want to know something. Did he sell up when he was a boy? <laughs> Good question to ask Papa when the big boy asks you to marry him. Did he soul up when he didn't get his way? And if, he, if, if the daddy says, uh, uh, well, uh, say thank you, tell him I said no. I don't tend to be catering to his soul up ways the rest of my life. Hey, man! Why don't you just pretend Larry Brown's preaching or something like that or Ronnie Simpson and have yourself a good time this morning? It's just me, amen. You ought to be ashamed to let him show disrespect. You ought to be ashamed to let him run in church. You ought to be ashamed to let him mouth off to people. Yes, sir. Why, some of you fathers ought to give me a $500 bonus just for preaching that. Thank you. Have to come back tonight. All right. You notice I said $5 and I went on my time. You're 500 on your side. Let me give you something good out of Scripture. Hey, does anybody know where the first time father was ever mentioned in the Bible? Does anybody think, 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 think? Father, $5, $5 within three seconds. Where's the first mention father in the Bible? I ain't gambling. I'm just offering a reward. Therefore, shall a man leave his father first time? Yeah. Ever mention the Bible? Watch this. I'll show you something. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife. Whew. Woo! How many sees the theological ramifications of that statement? Yeah. Therefore, shall a man leave Jesus Christ, left his father. 
giving you the salvation story. And cleave unto his wife, the church. And cleave means you stuck to it and can't get loose from it. And God the Son left God the Father and cleave unto his wife. I'm just giving you the gospel in the fatherhood situation, okay? Jesus of the last Adam, he foreshadows that God the Son would leave his heavenly Father and be joined and cleave unto his wife. And I tell you the wonder of it, that the God of glory would so establish redemption that we are not only forgiven. Hey, Brother Queen, he didn't just forgive me. He just didn't wash me. He just didn't reconcile me. He just didn't justify me. He just didn't reconcile me to himself, but he made me his son. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Made us his son through the new birth. Now the question arises, can you honestly bow your head this morning and say, my father, which art in heaven? Can you honestly call him your father? Is he just God to you? Have you been born again by the new birth? Have you been redeemed? Have you been saved? Have you been born into the family of God? And is God your father because you've received his son and God has birthed a new person? And you are a son of God through faith? Can you honestly call him your heavenly father this morning? Is he just God to you? Have you been born again? I want to give you some bad news. If you can't. That means that the devil is your father. For Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. And your mother is this world. Jesus Christ, as I said the first mention, watch this. Therefore shall a man, the man Lord Jesus Christ, left his father, cleaved his wife. But watch this. That first law I mentioned is a salvation verse in that, Brother Phil, I left my father the devil, and I cleaved unto the church. I want the pianist to come. I need a song book. Turn to page number 426. I had such a good time getting this message together, and it just don't seem like it turned out like I wanted it to. But I can't help it. Just did the best I knew with it. Thank you, brother. Number 426, we're going to stand together. Here's what I want you to do. Now, I preach kind of mean and ornery and stuff like that. But you know something, every once in a while, every once in a while, Brother Queen, I just like to talk to my daddy. And I want to tell you this morning, this little lamb of God. You may feel like that the winds are blowing at your soul, but you know what the real answer to all your problems is? Is talk to your father. Abba, Father. Let's sing that this morning. You want to come up and do business with God. Maybe here and you're not saved. You want to make God your father. You come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Repent of your sins and believe on Him, and God will become your father. And you'll know Him. Let's sing this morning. You're here as a child of God. You say, Brother Reggie, boy, oh boy, I just need to sit in my daddy's lap. I just need the arms of God around my soul. I just need to draw near to my Father today. I just want to be near my Father. Do you know what that some of our kids want? They just want to be near their Father. There are many, many bitter people in this world because they've never really known nor experienced fatherhood. It takes a lot of grace of God to get past that. You can. It takes a lot of grace. Let's sing this song.